here in 2019, they gave me an hour. So they gave me 25 minutes. So this is going to be a little bit of, of marketing on steroids. But and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on me because you can go look me up. You go to my website, you can look me up on LinkedIn. But I've got agency side, I've got client side, I've owned a few businesses, I've sold a few businesses, and since 2014, I'm a fractional chief marketing officer. So I go to a companies and I, I head up their marketing department. When I say marketing, the majority of people think about tactics, right? The website, social media, digital marketing, and that's great. But when I think about marketing, I think about understanding the competition, understanding the market itself, the dynamics within the market, understanding your customers and your prospects. And by doing that, you can build a foundation to help develop really your marketing plan on how to grow your business. Just by going to tactics, potentially you don't know what the right messaging is, you don't know what's relevant to the customer, and so you're just putting stuff out there. But if you do it through a, a process of understanding all the stuff that I'm gonna talk about today, when you get to the tactical stuff, you can be much more strategic in that. So, let's see if all this works. All right, here we go. So when I talk about a marketing plan, these are the elements that are in it. So when I'm working on something, I'm looking at, now you guys are all starting in a business, right? So you're over here, new market. I'm looking at your brand, you're looking at the competition, the target audience. We're going to dig into each one of these. Sales and distribution, and there's lots of other stuff for, for running a business. But ultimately, all these different pieces, and I can explain any of these. I'm willing to stay beyond the 20 minutes if you want to ask me questions. But all these are processes, things that I look at to truly understand how I can get to the other side and market to you as consumers. Or B2B. Right. Quick question, how many of your, uh, your projects your companies are B2B or B2B, B2B, okay, business to business. How many B2C, business to consumers, okay? Any direct to consumers, like commerce and stuff like that? Okay, yeah, good, okay. That all varies based on the audience you're trying to reach, based on the hierarchy in the B2B world. The person you might be talking to may not be the decision maker. And so you have to take all these things into account. So these are the areas that we're going to be talking about today. Now, the first place I start is research. Because how else am I going to find out what's going on in the marketplace? So we can do qu quantitative research. So that's statistical. That's like survey says kind of stuff that you can project against. So there you're doing uh, usually a survey instrument. You're going out to a certain population. Uh, Consumer-wise, minimum of 600 B to B, get down to two or 300, depending on ultimately the population that you're trying to get at. But ultimately, you want something that's strategic, 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 yeah, statistically projectable to give confidence to the people you're selling your business to, or you're pitching to, to get funding. Now, I'll address things like that today. Because ultimately, we need to know, if I build this widget, will somebody buy it? Quick story, uh, during COVID, I was approached by a person who had an idea for a business, and it had to do with the way we open produce bags in the grocery store. And, it was, and because in COVID, maybe when you would go shopping prior to COVID, you lick your fingers, you blow in the bag, you touch it, and now all of a sudden, nobody wants to touch the bag. So how do you open it? You know, you see people shaking it in the store and stuff like that. And this guy had an idea. So we went out and we surveyed a thousand consumers about their shopping habits. How did you shop before COVID? How are you shopping during COVID? How will you shop after COVID? And if you had this device, would it change the way you would shop after COVID? And we were able to use uh, statistical modeling, doing some predictive analytics to determine, yes, it was a viable product. As a matter of fact, if you were gonna launch this product, you should do it in Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, because it was a higher propensity for people to buy or try there first. And ironically, you would think that the consumer that was gonna buy the most product was gonna be a woman, but it was actually a man. Why? Because during COVID, 
most wives, if you will, I'll pick out my wife, would send me to the store to get COVID and not her. So qualitative research, that's when you're, you know, with focus groups, could be one-on-one -on -one surveys, in information, I do a ton of these. I've actually gone from doing a ton of quant, now doing a ton of qual. I'll literally go out and I'll talk to 10 or 15 customers of one of my clients, trying to understand their perceptions, their attitudes of what it's like to work with my client, but understand the industries and things that they're looking at that I need to know in order to draw some conclusions. Now, when I do qualitative research, I'm really after about 10 people. Not your brothers, not your sisters, not your aunts, and not your uncles, right? People that potentially would buy. Because if you've asked your relatives, what do you think of my idea? I guarantee most of them said, fantastic. And in a lot of cases, they're just giving you platitudes, right? So you want to get out and talk to the people that could potentially buy that would be interested in this. Um, one of the things I will mention, so um, I've been a mentor over at UCI. I also was an uh, adjunct professor over there a couple years ago doing this kind of uh, classes. And so one of the things I see a lot with startups and, and you know you guys putting your plans together is what I just said. I talked to my mom, she said it was great, therefore I'm launching this product, and then nobody buys. You with me so far? Secondary research. Everybody know what that is? So secondary research is going out and finding information on the internet, to industry trade shows, anywhere that it's pre-published information. Somebody else did the research, somebody published that data, and now you're using that data. And we call it secondary because it's secondhand. I can't manipulate it. If I do quantitative or qualitative, I did the work, therefore I can manipulate that data. If I use secondary research, I can't because you did it. I don't know your, I look at your methodology, but I don't have the data, I don't have the, the models, and so I have to judge who that person is. So when I use secondary research, what I counsel people to do is try to understand their methodology and understand where it's coming from. If I say I took this research from Gardner, everybody know who Gardner is? It's a big industry uh, research company. You'd go, ah, it's Gardner, I believe that. But if I said, hey, it was Bob, a really good research company, ah, I don't know Bob. Right, so you want to look for validity. Why? Because you're standing in front of somebody and telling them, here's my market. Here's my customer. Where'd you get the data? Oh, I, I got it off the internet. Well, how do I know it's any good? Right? So dig a little deeper to try to understand where it came from. That's why I like to go to industry research. Find the, the industry that they're coming out of, whether it's shoes or whether it's a widget or whatever it happens to be. So somebody in that industry is publishing data try to get a hold of that or these pieces of it that you can use to add validity to your program. Then there's analytics. And we can't forget what SEO, keywords, search volumes, Google Analytics could potentially tell you. And, and there's tools you can use, and some of them are free from the early models. Uh, SEMrush, for example, on SEO, um, Uber Suggest, where you can go in and put in a, a, a URL of a Editor, and it'll give you some data that you can look at and understand their keywords, for example. One of the things I look at when I use this for one of my clients is I want to know how many common keywords we have in, in, with another, with a competitor. And if I've only got 10 keywords or I've got a 50 keywords or 100 keywords, that means they're also buying the same words I'm buying. So it's giving me insights on how I need to change. In this Search volumes is another thing. I have a client um, about a month ago said, I want to add this keyword to my search volume, to my, to my keyword list. And so I did a search on it. And I called them up and I said, 10 people searched for this last month. And two people searched for it the month before. I don't think it's a good word. So you can go on and just type in, you know, Rolex watches, and you're going to see the, the search volumes on Rolex, on Daytona's, on Submariners or whatever it happens to be. And that's just there, it's just on the internet and you can dig that stuff up. So again, it adds a lot of details for you. Now, I've been in a lot of pitch meetings and I don't know how long you guys have in your pitch, but I've been in meetings where the person had two minutes to explain their idea, their market, 
why it was a good idea. And I saw a lot of them spend the entire two minutes talking about, well, I was walking down the beach and I had this great idea. And at the end, the investors go, but I don't know anything about what you're trying to sell. So one of the things they look at is TAM, total addressable market. How big is the market? What's the potential? A lot of people that are entrepreneurs first time around and they're setting their milestones of how big my market is, it's a billion dollar market and I'm gonna get 10% of it. It's unrealistic, it's not believable, right? So, but by knowing the size of the market, your potential investor, and I'll talk that way, because again, you're developing products and pitching the business, gonna know what the upscale is. Now, the next part though, is you wanna look at what's the serviceable market. So if the, if the TAM, the total market, let's say is a billion, there's the available market that you might get based on demographics, on geography, right? If I got a billion dollar market, worldwide market, but I'm gonna market in California, well, I don't have access to that billion dollars. I only have access to what's addressable here in my geography based on my demographic, right? So you're coming down. And then you're really looking at, and this is the key one, out of that serviceable market, let's say it's $500 million, what can I actually obtain? How many competitors are in there? If, if you're the last person in, you're now a challenger. And this guy's been in it for a year and he's a leader. So if he owns 15% or 20% and you're coming into the market, how are you gonna, are you gonna take share from him? Are you gonna create new opportunities to build share? So by understanding what you can actually obtain starts to set that foundation about how much money you might need to, to, to do your tactical things, to hire people off of that. And so this really gets you closer to what's realistic. So, so at the end of the day then, if you kind of flip that, where will you start, right? You're working your way toward ultimately the town or the arrow maybe should have gone the other way. All right, so you're looking for big and then bringing it down to what's accessible. And I'm assuming if you're building a business plan and marketing, part of, this, part of this is your marketing plan. You're, you're looking at how big is the potential for your market that you're, you're pitching on, or you're creating your product for. We good so far? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So how do you define your brand? Now, most people will tell you, and I know none of you will say this, that my brand is my logo. It, it, it's, it's an element of your brand, right? So I look at brand, and, and if I go back one, I'll, well, I'll get to it. What is your purpose? Why does your company exist? I provide marketing consulting. I go in, I sit at the C-suite table, I help them advise them on how to structure their strategies and their business. But what business am I in? And I'm in the business of helping companies achieve their goals. That's my simple purpose. And I do that through marketing. So I always like to ask, and I use this, this descriptor. The CEO of Black & Decker once said, people don't go to a do-it-yourself store because they need one of my drills. They go because they need a hole in the wall. Follow me? So you don't have to answer it today, but I want you to think about it. What business are you in? And if you're creating an apparel line, do you in the apparel business? No. Okay, there's an end emotional connection about what you're doing with your clothing. Looking at how do you position and how do you differentiate yourself from everybody else? I've, I've heard this over the years. I don't have a competitor. Everybody has a competitor, real or perceived, that somebody else is in the market selling something that may be utilized, right? There's a gazillion plastic bottles with water in them. But what differentiates them? If I put this next to Mountain Spring water, this conjures up a different brand, an image than the other bottles. And that's ultimately what I'm talking about. How do you differentiate yourself? If you've got a product that's gonna be sitting on a shelf, or if you've got a widget that you're gonna sell as an OEM, you have to have a position that helps define who you are in the marketplace. 
You don't want to make your customers work to figure out who you are. The last thing you want is to let your market define your business. If you let that happen, you've lost control. Right? So you want to take control and define who you are. And you do that by positioning and using differentiation strategies. Now, what's your promise? That's another part of your brand. What, what's the promise that you make? Is it a service promise? Is it guarantees that your product won't break down? So what is the promise that your business is making to the customers that are buying? You know, we guarantee that you know, this is 100% wool. Okay. Whatever it happens to be. I had a client one day that says, here's our service promise. If you have a problem with our product, send us an email. But if you don't hear from us in two days, give us a phone call. Well, that basically said, we don't care about you. Right? We don't care. We're just going to wait two days before we, get, before we wait for your phone call. So think about that promise that you're making, that your brand is making to your customers. And how can you fulfill that brand and that promise? Because once you break it, it's hard to get it back. Right? Ultimately, you got to be careful that you, this brand, even beyond your products or your services, whatever you're creating, brand ultimately is the most important thing. Because you can build up a brand. If I say Apple, that's an incredible brand. And all the products underneath it have some kind of a promise that Apple has instilled in us about the quality and about the functionality. Okay, and that takes time to get there, right? But they would fall on a sword before they let their brand get into trouble because it affects everything. And then the personality of your brand, right? Most entrepreneurs, when they start, their businesses take on their personality. And a, per brand, a brand's personality is just like a human. Right? Are you funny? Are you authoritative? You know, what are the characteristics that you want your brand to portray? Because part of that becomes the tonality and how you structure your communications. So I spend a lot of time in messaging and positioning because if my client wants to be authoritative, straightforward, and kind of a thought leader approach to their business, the way we write the, the copy for their website, for example, it's very different from the person over here that wants to be a little funny, a little humorous, right? So that kind of tonality and how it changes also adds to the positioning and about you know who the brand is. And the last part is the brand identity. That's the logo, that's the colors, that's all the other stuff. So if you think about that, I had a word up there and it went by, it was like 4PI. So that's four Ps, you know, purpose, positioning, promise, uh, personality and then the I is identity. So those are the elements that actually make up the brand, not just your logo. I remember somebody came to me one time and said, I got a great idea for a product or a new service. I go, what is it? And I go, oh, the name's fantastic. I go, but what's the service? Well, we'll worry about that later. The name is fantastic. But you can't market just a name. You gotta have something behind it. And the name is important, don't get me wrong. But you can define what the name is. How many times have you seen a name of a company and you go, I don't really get it. Down the street, Kajabi, right, on the building. I mean, that company is blown up. It's got incredible products. But if you just put the name up here on the screen today and you didn't know anything about it, and I said, look at, we're marketing Kajabi today, you're gonna go, what the hell is a Kajabi? So target audience. Now, normal stuff, demographics, geography, lifestyle, back to, again, who are you trying to talk to? If I want to talk to you as a 20-something year old, I'm going to speak to you very differently than if I'm talking to someone as young as me. So I have to understand what my triggers are. I worked, I was very fortunate and had a blast. I worked in the action sports industry for about 13 years. Everybody from DC shoes up to Nike. And everyone had their own brand, their own personality, and everything else. But how we communicated to a 14-year-old was very different than how, and a skateboarder was very different than how I communicated to a 30-something snowboarder. So you have to understand the demographics. If you're doing something in the business-to-business -business world, and you're trying to sell a new piece of software into a, an organization, 
who do you talk to? Do you talk to the purchasing agent? No, because ultimately they don't they don't have to use it. So are you trying to get, influence the IT person? So maybe you're targeting the IT person who has to go to the CFO to get permission, but ultimately the purchasing agent is going to be the one that signs the check. So ultimately, in, in a B2B world, you might be speaking to two or three different people within an organization just to get a sale. And if we've learned something over the years that they're never one and done, in a B2B world, it takes seven to 12 touches to actually get someone to make a sale. And the other thing that's kind of happened in this digital transformation world because of COVID is B2B or B2C, when you have a question or you want to buy something, what do we do? Anybody? Where, where do we go? We go to the internet, right? So you're ultimately, from a tactical standpoint, your website is your calling card, okay? But you just can't throw up a website without doing a lot of this stuff. Because we know someone's gonna go there and look for that information, and they better be able to find it. You better be in, high in the search because we as consumers don't go to page three and four and five of Google. If we don't find it in the first two pages, then we, then we put another search term in. Now, I like to ask these questions. What problem or pain point does your product or service solve? Just can't be, I got a new water. You know, I got a new mouse over here. Well, there's a gazillion mice out there. <laughs> Which one, why would I buy this one over yours? What's it solving? Maybe this is designed for right-handed people only, or it's designed for someone that had a broken thumb or something, whatever, right? What's the purchasing criteria that I was just talking about? Buyer personas, who are those people? What are their journeys? How do they figure things out? Have you, have you guys heard of the term at, attribution? So, so in, when we look at e-commerce as a, as a great one. So I worked for a luxury watch company and we looked at attribution and the way we structured it is how did they get there? What was their journey before they made a purchase? And sometimes that journey was long. So back to customer buyer personas and their journeys, I need to know that if someone wants to buy a t-shirt, they're gonna go to the internet, they're gonna start looking for stores or looking for online stores. They might hit four or five, then they might go to Amazon once they have price. Or I worked for PacSun for a while and we'd find that people would come in, they'd try out the clothes and then they go home and then go online and get it cheaper. All right, so you have to kind of understand what they're doing because you want to be able to serve up your information and your content as they're traveling in their journey. So buying cycles, again, if it's a widget, how often do they buy? If you're selling shoes. When I was in the action sports industry, we knew for, for a, an endemic skateboarder who skateboarded five times a week would buy a deck at least four times a year, minimum, along with shoes. And so we were able to project what the potential volume was and lifetime value, which is the LTV, of that individual. Right? Because depending on, again, your product and services, you don't want to just sell one thing. You want them to come back over and over. And so you're trying to build loyalty with them and your follow-up customer service and how you deal with them. Got a question? Um, so how would you reconcile the lifetime value of a customer if the main selling point for your product, say, is maybe longevity? Like, I mean, they're selling a product that lasts a long time, so you don't have to get another one. Then you're, in that particular case, for me, then I'd, I'd be looking at, back to the, the TAM, right? Of how big is the potential market? And then, can I offer you an add-on product, right? So, hey, you're gonna use this for the rest of your life. But oh, by the way, we have these cool lanyards you can buy, that, you know, it's like, so, you know, what are add-ons? How can you get them to buy one for their friends or family? Because um, otherwise, you know, again, depending on what your product and service is, the, the market is, you know, endless in a sense. You, you can continue to market them, and depending on the age demographic, right? So one of the things in the action sports industry, we would map out when someone would come into the action sports was about 12 or 13. And depending on what they were doing, skateboarding ended around 18, started to wane. Surfing and snowboarding started to pick up. 
But we also knew that once you kind of got out of skateboarding, and then we could see that the amount of people in skateboarding doing this. So we had actually look at demographics and look at basically birth rates. How many people were being born? You know, what was that cycle? How long did I have to wait until the next wave of 14 year olds came in that I could start marketing to? So in that particular case, that's, that was our feed. We knew the lifetime value of a skateboarder was 10 years. Surfer and snowboarder actually was 20 and 30 because you can still do that when you get a lot older. You don't see a ton of you know, 50 year olds out skateboarding. So there in that situation, we were looking at new people coming into the market for them. So one and done, but depending on what it is, I would assume you're gonna have more people coming into the market. Not only how big your market is, but new market. And geographic expansion. You're going to start in California, you're going to expand to the rest of the country, you're going to go to South America, go to Europe. So again, billions of people. Any questions so far? I tell you there's a test to see. No, <laughs> How am I doing on time? I'm trying to. You are, you are doing well. Just keep doing what Just you're doing. Just keep doing what I'm doing, okay? So who's your competition? These are the kinds of pieces that you need to look at. What's their revenue? How, how much of a competitor are they? As I said earlier, you go into the marketplace and there's already 10 competitors there and they own, between them, own 40, 50, 60% of the market. Then that only either leaves you 40 or the rest of the competitors in you or you're gonna have to steal share. That, those all require different strategies. I worked with uh, Gerber Baby Foods and we were launching in a uh, geographic area in, in uh, France. So Gerber, everybody knows Gerber, right? Big baby food company, we are Gerber, we're coming here, we're gonna take the market. And they failed miserably. Why? Because there was already a company in that region that made baby food. And the entire community, if you will, was loyal to them. And here comes Gerber as, you know, we're the leader in the world and, and this company's going, oh no, not really, they're the leader. They've been around here for, you know, 50 years and we love these guys. So Gerber had to go back and retool and reposition and come back in as a challenger, not a leader. Had to change the way they talked, had the way they communicated. Everything had to change in order for them to make inroads in this particular region in France. Market perceptions is always interesting and I ask this question when I work with new companies. How do your customers perceive you? Do they think you're easy to work with? Difficult to work with? Do, do they, you know, you got quality products, you're always coming back. And then target audiences, again, what's the problems and the pain point? What's their messaging? So I like to build a big matrix and I list a lot of this stuff across the top and I look at the competitors and I build this matrix to try to understand at a quick glance what my potential issues are gonna be. And through doing secondary research, I can start to figure out who some of the leaders are in the market and the ones I really have to pay attention to and worry about. Because everybody has a competitor. And so you have to understand what that is and who they are. Okay? like some of my clients going, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other one is how will you sell, or more importantly, how will they buy? Everybody just ever see uh, Field of Dreams with Kevin Costner? Anybody see that movie? It's a great movie. I want you to go home tonight and watch it. But in that movie, Kevin Costner hears someone talking to him, a ghost, and says, Build it and they will come. And it turned out to be, uh, I'll give it totally away, but it was a ghost telling him to build a baseball field in the middle of Kansas. What I think about it is build it and they will come is the other phrase I use a lot is hope is not a strategy. You can't hope your way to selling your product or your service. You have to develop a strategy. So building it and they will come means hey, I just spent a million dollars, I built this really cool pen, 
Nobody knows it exists. I don't have any money to market it. I don't know who's gonna buy it, but I'm pretty sure I can sell it. That's a difficult task. But if I went into the market and said, you know what, I'm thinking about this new idea for a pen. Why don't you try this new idea? What do you think about this? And all of a sudden you guys tell me, no, no, the, the pen's got a twist to work. No more clicking, it's got a twist. Well, now I'm thinking to myself, hmm, maybe I got an idea here. Because I asked the people in the market, potentially you're gonna buy it. So, when you think about how they're gonna sell, is it gonna be online, gonna be brick and mortar, it's gonna, you're gonna have an inside sales team, you're gonna have an external sales team, they're gonna be a company focus, you're gonna have sales reps, they're gonna be commission only, right? you're gonna partner up with some distributor, and somebody else is gonna sell your product and your service. I'm just starting to work with a company that does has a service depot in the medical field for medical devices for OEMs that are out to the marketplace. So you go into the hospital, you see these big displays and all these monitors. This company just actually repairs them for other giant corporations. So they're basically a partner for them. And now they're offering distribution. So now instead of sending the, the, uh, the product I just fixed back to you, they're warehousing it and then drop, sh drop shipping it to um, the people that want it. Are you on e-commerce? Is that how you're gonna sell? I just finished work with a luxury watch company. Everything was online. They're, matter of fact, they're brick and mortar, which was just as people walked in and maybe 10% of the business. But people were buying, spending lots of money to buy a Rolex watch, for example. And then they would ship it across the country. And their guarantee and their promise was you'll have it in 24 hours or 48 hours, I forget what it was. And if you're unhappy with it, you know we'll take it back. No questions asked. So how are you gonna sell? If you're gonna go brick and mortar, then you gotta think about rent, right? Electricity, all those kinds of things. That adds a lot of cost. When I was working with some restaurant franchisees, the cost to, to get into the franchise business was $350,000. It's a lot of money. But then you have to do building and everything else. Right, so those are not cheap. So if you're gonna build a retail store, a sell and a storefront, you gotta deal with that. Or are you just gonna create an e-commerce and online store that people can go and buy? And how are you gonna get it there? How are you gonna ship it? You're gonna add, don't forget that, you know, we all like free shipping, like Amazon, I love Amazon. But they're a behemoth versus you buy from somebody else and they're charging you, you know, $6.95 for shipping because they're trying to mitigate their costs, right? Trying to keep their profits up. There's a market segmentation. What segment, and back to all the demographic stuff we were talking about, what's the segment of the market that you're gonna to sell to? You're gonna to sell to everybody? You're gonna to sell to, you know, a shoe, brand new shoe for only people with size 10? That's a segment of the market, right? So again, you just have to think about Again, hope is not a strategy, and, and build it and they will come. It's gotta go watch the Kevin Costner movie, I'm sorry you do. It's not a strategy either. So these are the things, I'm, I'm hoping this is kind of getting across. There's a whole process to this. And you noticed I have not mentioned the word, I did mention the word website once. I didn't mention social media, I didn't mention digital marketing, uh, email marketing. I didn't really talk about the technical stuff because that comes later. If I don't know all of this, how do I communicate with you? How do I, how do I do something that's relevant to you to make you want to buy? So that's why all this is really important in developing your marketing plan. Then of course, now I'm gonna talk about tactics. And so I look at this kind of funnel and the funnel could be this big, it could be, it could be three, it could be four, depending on what your funnel is. But ultimately, I have to build awareness. And so I find events, you know, trade shows, blogs, emails, social media, digital marketing, SEO, pay. Those are all good ways to build awareness about your product and your service. Now, as we move down the funnel, and now I've got, now I've got some interest. Now I'm looking at maybe some emails, signing up for some newsletters, doing some video, some more digital marketing, maybe doing some personalization on the website content. You know I've been there. You want, to, you want me to keep seeing the same stuff I've seen before? No, you can personalize it so new content will pop up based on my business habits. 
and this kind of going through consideration. And you can start to see that some of these start to change. Why? Because the, the tactics, the journey, remember I talked about the journey earlier on. My journey has changed. Instead of up here, I have no idea who you are. I see this really cool widget that you're selling. I go to your website, I'm interested, but I, I don't buy. Now I come back again, now what happens? You're gonna start me all over again at the top? No, you wanna move me. You wanna try to get me more interested in what you're selling. And so you're gonna give me a little bit more information. You're gonna show me a video. You're gonna move me down the path or on my journey. When we put these plans together, ultimately on the tactical side, and knowing the work we've already just done, I have a pretty good idea of what's going to work and what's of interest, because I've already been asking them, how do you consume information? How do you go about finding out about you know, a pair of boots? I ask friends, or I go to the website, I go in and I Google cowboy boots, and I start to see things pop up. So again, what's that journey as we talk about? And I think I'm probably a little over, but that is kind of my marketing plan in a nutshell. There's my website, there's my email. I'm happy to talk to you guys about anything if you want to email me or have a question. But let's, let's chat. Thank you. <clears throat>